Welcome back to the Puzzle Minds podcast, where we help piece together those 2 a.m. thoughts. Today, we have Crystal Denise Garcia. Um, So thank you for coming on and joining us. She is a self-love coach, a transformational speaker, and a dream facilitator. She is also a survivor of covert sex trafficking and helps others in their journey to uh, recovery with self-love. So I kind of wanted to start off with, you know, could you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to where you were? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very long journey, so I'll try and be concise. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here with you guys. Um, so yeah, so I grew up with a lot of trauma. I mean, my whole life was trauma, and that's not an exaggeration. I, you know, I was sexually molested when I was about eight years old. I have other trauma earlier, but and uh, so my life was violence. My life was sexual violence. My life was physical, emotional, you know, psychological violence me, that was normal. I tried to run away when I was 17. And that was the first time I was sexually exploited. And then when I went to college very briefly, when I was 18, just trying to get away from abuse. And while I was there, I, it was just a horrible, you know, um, experience. And I found myself being trafficked. I found myself being pimped. I found, then I, um, myself being a stripper. So for about 13 years, I was being covertly sex trafficked. And for a lot of people that don't understand what that term is. So it's something I call because most people when they hear sex trafficking, they only think of the people who have been um, abducted. And so that's the main trafficking that people hear of. But the reality is, there's also covert sex trafficking, where we have a society that's set up, we have economic uh, differences, we have addictions, we have, so we have people ready to exploit those who've been sexually abused, who are addicted and all of that stuff. And I, you know, was all of the above. And so covert sex trafficking is all about the coercion. And what I tell people is pimping 101 is leaving the pimped feeling like they chose it. And so there's a lot of disdain for people who are in the so-called sex industry. And so Mm -hmm. there's a lot of victim blaming where people um, put down sex workers and all the stuff. But the reality is, and that's why I call it covert sex trafficking, because it's all sex trafficking. It's just different modalities. And so I was in it for about 13 years. I was a professional dominatrix for 13 years. Within those 13 years, I was a stripper for nine years. And within those years... I was a quote unquote prostitute for seven years, which is just, I was, I was covertly trafficked. And when you say uh, covertly trafficked, so the covert, the, the covert uh, aspect of that term essentially uh, alludes to the fact that it's something it's trafficking, but it's being masked by something else. Am yes. I understanding that correctly? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of people think, Oh, well they wanted it or they went there. There's a lot that goes into someone yeah. like, quote unquote, choosing these things. And it's not a choice if all of these things are stacked up against you. If you've lived a life of abuse. And manipulation, correct? Exactly, exactly. So if if you've lived a life of abuse, like I did, I lived a whole life of abuse. To me, abuse was normal. So, you know, my mind was already, you know, and I was an addict. So, you know, between being a sex addict, you know, being alcoholic and all this stuff, all of my addictions kept me being exploited as well. So these people were exploiting you know, my addictions and my trauma. So, yeah. Okay. Well, that, I mean, when I say like, it's an incredible, I mean, the fact that you're able to summarize that in such a concise manner, hats off to you to begin with. Let me start off by saying that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I want to touch on a lot, lot, when you say like this term of covert sex trafficking, Mm -hmm. because like, like you said earlier, you said, um, you mentioned like, we think of, when we hear the word trafficking, we think of it in a very traditional manner. Like someone is walking down the street, they get grabbed in the van, and then they end up in Ukraine, you know, being forced to have sex with like, you know, people they don't want to, right? Right. So mm-hmm. the covert minds, the covert sex trafficking is something that's very interesting to me because you're probably the first person I've heard explain it in a very, like, in a very, like, I know, like open a manner. different perspective. Because, yeah, exactly. A different perspective because it's always it's always shown in very blunt forms. Like we just mentioned before, it's like, you know, getting abducted or, you know, whatever being like, you know, like having addiction issues and then being thrust in the situation as a result. But um, what forms of like covert sex trafficking do you see that are like kind of prevalent today? Cause like you mentioned, like, for example, yeah. you know, being a dominatrix, that's something to me. I was mm-hmm. like, that's very interesting because I've never associated that, you know, that, uh, you know, I guess you can say like that work or, like, you know, 
I guess, covert sex trafficking. Because I always associated the person that is the dominatrix as being empowered, actually. You right, know, sure. You, you know, you're like, you know, I guess, you know, my limited knowledge of, you know, BDSM. But, you know, with people, like you're basically beating up businessmen. Like the guy's like, I make a bill, have a billion dollar company, but I want you to stomp on my nuts. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like I've always asserted, uh, associated you being the person that's inflicting whatever as the person in power. But from what you described, it's actually like a form of manipulation because it seems like mm-hmm. you were, it was, a, you thought, you, I guess you felt as if the profession was something that you wanted as a result of the trauma you went through. And then as you healed, you realize, oh, this is not what I want. Is that kind of like on the lines yeah, of- Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, really spot described? on. Yeah, absolutely. Really spot on. And and the thing is what people don't realize, because that's a conversation that's out there and that's that's part of the coercion. That's part of why it is coercive and it is covert sex trafficking mm-hmm. because it, it creates the, the illusion of power. And if you have people who are traumatized, and if you have specifically women, if we're talking about right now, when we're talking about dominatrix, who are traumatized, women who are traumatized are trying to find their power. They're trying to find their sense of power. And so okay. if, from the outside in, if you look at a dominatrix, you think she's in power. You think she's so powerful. Oh yeah, this, she's the one who's holding the whip. She's the one that's holding X, Y, and Z. But at the end of the day, it's an illusion. It's all an illusion because at the end of the day, she's being pimped, right? She, she, she takes a percentage. Someone's taking a percentage. She's being pimped. And, and the idea, you know, a lot of people don't understand with BDSM, um, who's in quote unquote power is not always as it seems. So when you have someone who's paying you to be a dominatrix, who is really in control? You know, so it, it's, it, 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 it does seem as if someone is in power that, that is not but it's, it's just not the case. And a lot of people think that, you know, people like, oh, well, someone's getting paid. So if some, it's two people doing business and that, that is the greatest gaslighting tactic at all because um, sex trafficking is not, is not someone being in business. It's someone being sex trafficked, but the, the industry creates the illusion that it's, oh, it's just another business like any other. Mm-hmm. It's a business. It's, it's a business of sex trafficking. And so uh, people think, well, they're getting paid and people think, well, that means it's consensual. No, actually the, the fact that money is exchanging hands, money exchanges hands to bypass consent. Oh, uh, so, so would you say, okay, so for, I guess like, I'm like, I'm like, I guess going to play devil's advocate. Right. And in this regard, like, so for example, is, would you say that all people in the, you know, like, let's say the adult entertainment entertainment industry or sex uh, people that are in like these sex, sex workers sex workers yeah like th- would this apply to them so is this a specific case by case so when you say like for example someone who's like being in the pimp. porn industry or something like maybe like only fans like how does that work with oh god don't get me started <laughs> only fans. Yeah, i okay. mean we have we have so, nothing but time we have nothing but time yeah, so, yeah. so go only ahead and yeah fans, this is okay so those of us who have been in the industry, who have, who have survived it and who are, and it's the sex trafficking industry who have survived it and mm-hmm. we're speaking up, we're often met by people who are in the sex trafficking industry who are apologists and who are like, no, I love it. And hey, maybe there is a 0.001%. I don't know. What I will tell you is I can't speak for everybody, but what I will tell you is I haven't met one yet. Um, I haven't met one person who's like, yeah, I absolutely love it here and everything's great. And I've always had a wonderful time. So I'll tell you what I'll speak for myself is I used to say all the, I used to be like, yeah, I'm so empowered. This is amazing. And I'll tell you that's, that's uh, important to survive it, to survive being like exploited is to believe mm-hmm. a lie. And you get fed a lot of gaslighting. You get fed a lot of BS and society, society promotes it. You know, society promotes it. And this is how people need to be yeah. conscious because when people talk crap about sex workers, mm-hmm. what you're doing is you're pushing people deeper into the sex industry. Mm-hmm. That's what it did to me. Okay. Could you elaborate on that? Was, so, how, like, so when you push someone deeper into something, you're essentially talking negative about, how does that not cause them to want to distance themselves from? No, self-harm? of course not. No, it doesn't. Because if you're getting crap from people in society and you're getting crap from the pimps, for me, it was better the devil I know. Okay. So when people talk crap about sex workers, like what people need to realize is they are actually feeding the pimps. 
So everybody who's out there playing holier than thou, get off your mm -hmm. high horse because what you're doing is you're actually being a pimp like in in, in another sense. You're, you're supporting the pimp. You're, you're like a, being a pimp. Uh, what, what, would, what would that word be? I can't think of the word right now. Pimp assist. There you go. <laughs> so, like an enabler, like a pimp supporter or something. Yes, sort. exactly. A pimp supporter. So I really want people to get conscious of that because um, like there's a lot of people who get on their high horse and they're like, you know, sex workers this and sex workers that. And I don't even, sex workers is just not a term that, you know, I even adhere to, but it's just something that we use because it's most commonly used. Um, but really it's survivors. So what I'll say for myself is I had to repeat the same rhetoric. I enrolled people in that world because I was enrolled in that world. So for me, that's all I knew. So of course I was praising it. Of course I was praising it, but as I began to heal, as I began to go to therapy, as I got life coaching, as I did the work, as I started to, you know, re relook at my life and as I got healthier, all of the illusions began to fade. Uh, okay. So yes. it's like a, so that's the truth more or less, for at least your personal truth. I'm sorry. What'd you say? This is almost like enlightenment, essentially like you being essentially once you realize you went to therapy, once you went to therapy, it started taking away the veil, which you had created for yourself, which was the rhetoric you kept saying like, oh, well, this is okay or whatever justification. Well, it was, it was created for me, you know, like it was something that was already here. It's not something that was like from deep in my soul. You know, these illusions are created to keep people in the, to keep me, people being exploited. So we have society doing it and then we have the pimps doing it. And then as an addict, you know, all of my addiction kept that alive as well. So it, yeah, it really wasn't me wanting to do it. It was all very subconscious and it wasn't something I was conscious of at all. So, but yeah, it had an impact. And then um, we were talking about what OnlyFans, is that mm -hmm. what that website's called? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So for those who don't know, who are listening, and if you think OnlyFans is a great idea, I'm gonna let you know, it's the same old game, just a new pimp, all right? Mm. These people are making money off of you. And if you think, just because I don't even know how it works. I don't know if they're getting a cut off of everybody's stuff, but at the end of the day, they're pimps because they're having advertisers and people who are advertising with them are supporting the pimping. This is all sexual exploitation. And a lot of people misconstrue being sexually empowered with being sexually exploited because in our society, we really just don't know the difference. So, so yeah, so that's actually, that's actually a really good um, thing because only fans, I, I don't, I don't really track like the history of that, but I know that it came at a very opportune time for lack of a better word in the sense of mm -hmm. like um, COVID, you know, and people are out of work. And so, you know, some people saw OnlyFans as a way to, to meet their, their basic needs in terms of like getting food, you know, um, yeah, I mean, so providing for their shelter, like whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But we always have this facade that it's quote empowering women and, mm -hmm. You know, so we actually had a, a few episodes um, in our catalog where we interviewed some people uh, that were, I guess, OnlyFans creators. I don't, I don't know what the, the title is, but they, um, they, uh, they're on the platform, you know, and they do um, acts, whatever, whatever they do. But, mm -hmm. you know, we, like, I, I guess I can only speak for myself. I was in that notion that, yeah, you know, this is, um, kind of helping with like the, the sexual empowerment of women, you know, they can do whatever they want with their body, like they're in control of it, that no one's going to say anything. But then you introduce this um, perspective, you know, into how society kind of promotes it. And it's just a facade, you know, you said yeah. it's the uh, same game or new game, same pimp, something like that. And I was yeah. like, oh shit, like yeah. that. That's a new, I would have never thought of it like that, you know? No, of course yeah. not. And, and that's the thing most people wouldn't because most people haven't been in that world, you know? So it's, you know, um, but that's why these people prey off of people because most people aren't hearing these conversations because also a lot of the times when, when people like me speak up, we get shut down really fast and they'll be quick to grab a sex worker and use him or her as a weapon against us, mm -hmm. which is even sicker, right? So it's, it's very twisted. It's very twisted. So there is nothing sexually empowering towards women about pimping women. Okay. So it's the most disgusting lie that's been told over and over again. Oh, she's so empowered. We support you. What's empowering? 
what's empowering that you support her? You really want to support her, listen to her consent, because right now you're paying money to tell her to shut up about her consent. There is nothing empowering about the exploitation of women. So why why does this why is um like for example like I, I guess I'm, try, I'm trying to put this in a way that's kind of like makes sense but like for example stripping stripping for example has a negative stigma associated with her right like everyone always says you know like you never want to raise your daughter to be a stripper you never want to do it so there's a negative association with stripping that has stood the test of time mm-hmm. for some reason only fans and things of like I guess only fans and I guess patreons and whatever other kind of like you know you know exchange of money kind of like mm-hmm. sexual platforms that are out there they don't they're immune to that stigma like only fans if, if you even talk in a negative about only fans you're almost seen as a bigot in nowadays and that's the thing that i'm wondering why why based on like what you've said because mm-hmm. me, me i subscribe to the theory that essentially if you have to justify you justify doing something mm-hmm. and like, like almost like what you said before, where it's kind of like you had to tell yourself a lie. You had to justify doing, if you have to justify doing something, that's a sign that this thing may not be a positive thing, right? Yes. Who am I the judge? We all have our life circumstances. We all have our, you know, lifestyles. So I'm not mm-hmm. saying something is good or bad, but what I will say is, is it good or bad for you, the individual? Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's yeah. a very important distinction because I don't, I don't operate with, within good or bad, wrong or right mm-hmm. either yeah. um i i i focus on what is healthy exactly healthy is the perfect word because hell yeah exactly healthy has no moral alignment healthy exactly. essentially is just something that is at the end of the day will you survive this whether it's mentally physically or you know spiritually exactly exactly yeah. and the illusion too is that we make a lot of money now mm-hmm. in in um as far as in the moment here's and here's the thing that people may not know about stripping. Okay, well, first of all, stripping is still pimping. So if you're going into a strip club, you're feeding a pimp too. There is no such thing as a strip club owner. He or she is a pimp. And yes, there are women who own strip clubs. There are female pimps too. Mm-hmm. So um, the the thing that people don't understand about strip clubs is when you when strippers go in there, when we go in there, we have to pay a house fee. We have to pay a pimp fee, right? So you can go mm-hmm. in there and the second you walk in the door, you're owing about a hundred bucks, 75, hundred bucks. You're- so if you and haven't so, made, if you haven't danced, haven't gotten money, you're in a negative from just exactly. being exactly. And if there's a shit week, you're negative a couple hundred bucks. And people don't think that you know they think oh you just go in there and you make thousands a day. Hell no, hell no you don't. And if you do, then you're probably mixing a couple of worlds. You probably you know most who did are probably mixing you know the prostitution with the strip. Mm-hmm. And so the thing that people have this big illusion as to what stripping is, and it's like yeah there could be nights where you do do good but there are many nights where you don't where you could not do you know depending on the economy depending on what's going on and then on top of that what people don't realize is that they get so infatuated with the money but it's an illusion because at the end of the day all of the money that i had to spend on my addictions just to keep myself numb to the reality that i was being exploited i didn't know i was freaking being exploited because i was being told all these lies that society keeps propping up Women are being sexually empowered, and this is how women are free. This is how women are free when you pimp them. Get the hell out of here. So really, for all of, for all of the money I made and all of the money I had to spend just to survive the moments, just to numb myself enough to be sexually violated over and over again, I could have made more money at McDonald's. Sheesh. Wow. Well, you're almost indebted to, like, indebted to, excuse me if this like, sounds insulting, but indebted to your life choices, right? And tell me a little bit more about what you mean by that. So indebted to your life torch is essentially like the circumstances that you were thrown into. Ah, uh, yes, like, like, yes. So for yeah. example, when you like, for example, a lot of girls right now, like, you know, you know, they're not even women, it's just people in general, because OnlyFans is not just a female-based platform, you know, it's right? everything. Mm-hmm. So when I say indebted to, you know, your life choice, it's not like life choice in terms of you actively made these choices. Right. There's choices that if, unfortunately you were thrown into throughout the course of your life. Right. And with all like things like, for example, of OnlyFans, you're basically in debt right now and don't even realize it because mm-hmm. like you said, like for example, therapy opened your eyes to, oh my God, I don't like this. I don't want this. And you had to do a 180. Like you're driving on the highway, you had to do a 180. The yeah. cost of that 180 costs, essentially costs more than the money that you thought you were making. Exactly. Exactly. And all of the healing that I had to do extra because of that, I mean, I already had trauma. 
You know, I didn't need extra trauma to heal from, you know, so, you know, it, all it does, all I got from that was more trauma. That's what I got. And that's unfortunate. And the fact that you are actually speaking about this, when I say that, I hope that this actually changes. It's like, it's like, it's not even like, for example, like you, you have a lot of people that are very black and white, right? Yeah. Some people that are in support of things, some people that are, you know, like not like you're against things. The way that like, honestly, this conversation is even going so far is incredible because you're just essentially showing people choices. This is what you're doing. This is one way you can go. This is the other way you can go. Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually a very powerful thing because a lot of times, for whatever reason, I believe that this generation has a strong, you know, like a strong need to rebel against any sort of like opinion. It doesn't matter what it right. is. Someone says something is I've noticed. Yeah, you got know, uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or like, die. It's like, okay. <laughs> I can, you, can, you can almost tell people, like, literally, this will burn you alive. If you do this, you're dead. They're like, well, I want to try because you told me not to. It's like, <laughs> come on. I'm doing this. Yeah. I, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this information. or providing this information or knowledge or exposing certain things out of, you know, with positive intent. But there's yeah. this very rebellious mindset that is not like the punk rock rebel back in the day where it's like right. pink mohawk and F you, mom and dad, let's rock. You know, it's not that. <laughs> Like right. I'm just going to do the opposite of whatever you say, even if it's to my own detriment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I feel as if like a lot of people, like a lot of these companies are actually exploiting. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And here's the thing, because, you know, we had spoken about like, we're not coming from a moral place. Here's the irony of it. And I don't know if I'm, perhaps I'm using irony incorrectly. So who knows? <laughs> but the, the, the bizarreness and, and the, the twistedness of it is, a lot of people, you know, when it comes to like BDSM, we're talking about BDSM, we're talking about sexual exploitation, we're talking about porn, all this stuff. The reality is a lot of these things are morality based. And I'll, I'll go into what I'm saying. As far as BDSM, like the whole point of like the whole part of BDSM, people will say it has a point, but the reality of what BDSM is, it is sexual violence. So sexual violence is, I mean, you can date all this stuff back, the whole deflagellation, there was a whole order of like very, God, that was way back. I mean, we're talking about way, way, way back at where people would self-flagellate, you know? So BDSM is very moralistic. It's very rigidly moralistic. And I'm not interested in having my sexuality controlled and repressed. So it's very interesting how like it can be twisted into like someone could be like, oh, you're a prude because you don't like BSM. No, actually, I am sexually positive and there's nothing sex positive about sexualized violence. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, we, we had, um, I guess, c- come to the notion that we like BDSM is a, I guess, a choice between two people. And, you know, and that's we, I, for me, at least, you know, I don't, I don't indulge in any BDSM. And so from the, from the outside perspective, I'm like, Oh, you know, that's like a sexual preference uh, or not sexual preference, but a sexual act that they prefer. But, you know, when you bring it in the light of it being um, like a form of like abuse, I guess I'm like, Oh shit. Like that actually, again, that's another way to look at it. And I'm like, Oh, well that, that actually kind of makes sense because, you know, it's this whole and I use the word facade a lot in this mm-hmm. particular conversation, but it is kind of like a facade of um, like a sexual preference of what you want to do. But, right. you know, a lot of people just look at it in a very single minded, like a single track way yeah, of looking very at linear. it. Yeah, yeah. One, yeah. And that's to your point, John, that's the thing that's actually very interesting where it seems like things work like for whatever reason, when it comes to things that are, I guess, you know, like exploitive in nature, there is, oh, the society always points you to one direction or the other. Like back in the day, it's all about repression. You know, it was all about like, you know, female, you know, women and females cannot be, they cannot expo- like, you know, express their sexuality in whatever manner they want. So it was all about oppression, right? Mm-hmm. And then now it seems like it's about manipulation. And the our irony is that like, it, it still is oppression. It's just yep, coming in a different changed. form now. It hasn't yep. changed. It's just like, mm-hmm. no, it's actually the oppressors have gotten smarter, unfortunately. <laughs> exactly. You hit it right on the head because the, what people don't understand is this is still sexual repression. It's just a flashy side of it. 
Exactly. So it's, we've gone from one side, we've gone to the deep repression, don't express any sexuality. Then we've gone to the flashy form of mm -hmm. repression, do not connect with your sexuality. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the sexuality that's going on right now, get drunk, get high, and then have sex really fast and never talk to yeah. each other again. That's not having a relationship with sex. And it doesn't, and I'm not talking about, oh, don't have a one night stand. I'm talking yeah. about the consciousness in, in the connection. Because if you're, you're spending one night with a person that's completely conscious and, and that's your thing, mm -hmm. well, who am I to say that's your thing? Yeah, but exactly. most people are not conscious when they do it. And that's what it is. It's not about how much sex people have or how little sex people have. It's not about numbers. At the end of the day, it's about presence. And people mm -hmm. are numbing themselves to not relate to sexuality and calling it sexual empowerment. And then shaming those of us who are standing for sexual sexual liberation prudes yeah it's, it's yeah, yeah. absolutely so, fascinating so okay so that that's like a very interesting point so like when you say like you know sexual actual sexual empowerment right mm -hmm. so what what so we like what is actual sexual empowerment in your own point of view like what is it so clearly you know like giving someone a platform to essentially publicly like as we discussed like you know be manipulated because it's almost it seems like you no know, it's a very divisive kind of topic because like with only fans you have some people that are like love it they're like yeah i can do whatever i want i can make money it's like okay you can make your money but at the end of the day like you like like you said earlier like you're going to pay the price that is far more expensive than what you're earning right now in terms of whether it's financially or you know you know let's say in terms of in, in, um egotistically in terms of like the uh, actual um I guess you can say the amount of people that are seeing it, mm -hmm. but when it comes to actual, like, you know, healthy sexual empowerment, which mm -hmm. and, and, that, and sexual empowerment doesn't apply to just, you know, like female sexual empowerment or male sexual empowerment or, you know, anything in between. Like, what would you do? How, what do you think is the actual empowerment where essentially you can do whatever you want, but. Well, yeah. Well, I want to address first. Manner. What is that? Yeah. I want to address the first, this mentality of I can do whatever I want. And that is exactly the issue. And it's exactly oh, right. what keeps pimps fed, okay? And it's exactly what mm -hmm. keeps the sexual exploitation hidden and going on in, in our own backyards. So people have this idea, I'll do whatever I want. Okay, but it's actually very self-absorbed. And this is why, you know, we don't get to have healthy experiences um, because everyone is just like, I'll do whatever I want. Well, okay, but there's an impact. And the okay. impact is, let's say there are some people, let's say there's a 0, 0.0 percentage of people who absolutely adore being sex workers and everything has gone magical for them. I haven't met one, but let's just go into that la-la land for a second. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because there are so many people who are being harmed. So at the end of the day, let's say there's one person who's like, I love this, it's amazing. So who cares? I'm fine. It's the same thing like saying, Oh yeah, I know that person. Oh, you got raped with them, but I didn't get raped by them, so whatever. Uh, so it's almost like essentially using experiences to invalidate the truth. Yes, if and I it's also, yeah, exactly, exactly. And it silences victims. And I'm sorry, well, actually, I'm not sorry at all. Um, if you have to do something, if you're doing something, if you're speaking up and are confronted by survivors coming forward and you think that survivors speaking up is gonna cost you money, take a second look at to what the hell you're doing. Hmm. And that's the thing that I think that reason why you see such divisiveness because you see a lot of people like the people that get mad at people speaking up are probably the people that are benefiting off of people staying quiet. And it's disgusting because when people like, and pimps will use other, you know, former workers who are either still like knotted out or maybe they really love what they're doing that whatever, but they'll use them as weapons against those of us who are standing up and given voices to other survivors, to other victims who are trying to leave. So they're being used as a hammer by the pimps and society jumps in and praises those sex workers and like, oh my God, it's amazing. And numbs out to the reality that there are so many victims. There are so many men, women, transgender, even children who are trying to get the hell away. Mm -hmm. You know, people are being trafficked and it's horrifying. And so people, you know, like, oh, well the sex work and, and you know, sex trafficking and that's separate. No, it's not. It's the same freaking world. You just got enrolled to paying for it. 
So do you, do you experience a lot of like pushback whenever you speak um, about this top topic? Absolutely. Like what? Um... Absolutely. Nonstop. And the first ones who do it are the other workers. And it makes me sad because, and I, I, I don't really engage in it. You know, I'll, I'll have a little mm-hmm. back and forth, but I, I'm not going to argue with them because I know what that was like. I was there. So quite frankly, it makes me sad because I know what it felt like to be there. And so I get so angry at the pimps. I get so angry at society who has bought the nonsense and who parades these women and men and transgender, whoever they can. So they're being exploited to a whole nother level. And this time they're using all of that. And I'm not saying that they, they don't, they're not autonomous. They have their own, you know, they have their, they're standing in their voice as well. But when they use their voice to attack survivors, it's really just sad to me. It's really sad. I I don't really engage. It just, you know, it makes me sad. And I just move on because I'm not here to enroll people. I'm here to stand people and create awareness. So there's people who are just dead set. I mean, then we're not, this conversation isn't for you. And I'm not here for you. I'm here for the people who are trying to get out. I'm here for the people who are curious. I'm here for the people who have never heard about this, who might be contemplating the world and who don't have the full picture because exactly this is me bringing forward the full picture because people don't have the full picture. People think they're getting options. No, they're being told, get in. That's not an option. <laughs> if you're yeah. not hearing our voices, then that is not an option. You're not being given a choice. And even that quote unquote choice is nonsense because it's pimping, gaslighting, no one. Yeah, I could see, I could see it being very sad and um, you know, you're yeah, trying to, you know, you're trying to uh, create awareness of of this whole situation, but uh, you know, they can't really. Uh, I don't know if the word is like, you know, they don't really see. I guess maybe your point of view, but you know, you you trying to create awareness and just trying to, you know, it's it's kind of like trying to like a mother, like a, a child. I guess is is that a, a a right way to look at it? You know, you're like, oh, like I've, I've been through it all. And I'm trying to to show you like the the ropes of life, you know, in terms of yeah. that particular industry. I mean, hindsight yeah, is funny, funny. Like that's really what it comes down to. When it, like Crystal has a yeah. perspective that is like she's been in it and she's been out of it, so her opinion mm-hmm. is comes from a point of reference and also it comes from you know like knowing what's to come. If you know, because let's be like, let's be real, like not everyone makes it out of certain lifestyles, right? Exactly. Not everyone survives. She is speaking like she is a survivor. Like she survived it. So like she's speak. She's not speaking from. This is what I think may happen. She's speaking from. This is what is going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when she gets pushed back from what it sounds like, it's like it's actually people that are currently engulfed in the lifestyle that can't see the end of the tunnel. She's at the end of the tunnel, mm-hmm. you know. And yeah. that's the part that's unfortunate because it does sound like. It, you have to, get to remind yourself for right? like you know every for every person that that you can you know i guess to say like save or you know you know show the truth to so they at least are presented options because like you said earlier it said it's not a choice if you don't know both sides of the story mm-hmm. if you only know exactly. one side of the story it's like okay well this is your truth because this mm-hmm. is all you know but if you see both sides of the story and you choose something then you had a choice because you know that you knew that it could go this way or that way i chose this way that's a choice. Choice is at least but, two or more right. options, right? But even that is not really a choice because it's coercion and these people are masters at it. But yeah, it's, it is heartbreaking, but I, I was there. And that's why I, mm-hmm. I have like, I'm like, I have compassion for it. I won't engage in it. Like I, I won't spend time with it because I'm like, this conversation is not for you. Then if you love it, then what, what's the problem? Why are you defending mm-hmm. it? Um, but it's, uh, I, I feel for them. And it also reminds me of where I was where I used to be. And also what's, but what really angers me is the people who have never been in the world jumping in and trying to tell me what that world is. Mm -hmm. That piss, that just flat out pisses me off. I have no compassion for that at all. And I mean, I I have to an extent, but I, it's pure ignorance and it's actually very Mm -hmm. dangerous. These people are like, this is sexual impairment. I'm like, you were never even in it. What the hell are you talking? Are you seriously going to tell me? Someone who was in it, I was actually creating a BDSM school. Like I was going to train submissive switches, slaves, and subs, and other so dogs. You, like, let me ask you this: uh-huh. Is there is there a realm or essentially se- sexual freedom? And I guess um, 
so I, I, I feel like the all right. So I'm I, I just gonna sound like a kind of like a side tangent, but I'm gonna try to like make it come back full circle. So I I hear and understand like what you're saying, and I'm wondering like okay, so we hear this side where it's like essentially like this this dark side. It's like the underground to everything. Like every every aspect of society has the you know one end, which is like the ideal situation and the opposite end when essentially an ideal becomes abused and corrupted and perverted right so is there a realm where sexual freedom and healthy sexual expression does exist without constraints because what it sounds like is that constraints are essentially what are needed to make sure people don't get exploited so this isn't the dark side of the sex industry this is the sex industry i'm talking about so, so you're saying the sex industry is a dark side. Like it's not even yeah. like, okay. So no, what this is in the dark side? This yeah. is it. This is what it is. And most so people what is, are told that the, this isn't it, but this is what it is. So what is sexual liberation then? Is, is sexual liberation, even it's like being able to do, essentially express yourself or do whatever you want to do within uh, parameters or Here, what is yeah. in your opinion? Here comes, well, it's unique for every individual. So I can't tell someone who's sexually empowered and who isn't. But at the end of the day, it, it, we go back to that, I can do whatever I want thing. Sure, mm-hmm. I can do whatever I want. Is that healthy? Absolutely not. Mm-hmm. And it's not about parameters. And a lot of people think that, that if they're not out there doing whatever they want, they're being restricted. But that's the illusion. Actually, when people are out there doing whatever they want, they restrict their life and their sexual um relationship with sexuality incredibly and so people are so used to Uh seeing sexual liberation as this outside action all of the time but that's not what a healthy sexuality automatically looks like so what it's going to look like specifically is going to be different for every individual but it does take time to first be present with self a lot of people are out there just using other people to jerk off and you know and to get off and that does not equate to sexual liberation just because you can have an orgasm, yeah. you know, and people think, oh, well, I, I have a bunch of orgasms. So that automatically makes me sexually empowered. No, it doesn't. If you're numbed out or if you're hurting yourself, that's not sexual empowerment. So it kind of sounds like self-love is like the, um, not, not remedy, but that's the way to the start of that whole journey. It's the beginning. Yeah. It's the beginning and health you know, Mm -hmm. uh, therapy, coaching, you know, taking time with one's own body and getting related to how we are reacting with our own body. Because I'm, I'm a sex addict in recovery. So I had to take time and actually get related with what my relationship was with my own body, with my own sexuality, you know? And so a lot of people don't do that. And they think, oh, I'm just going to go run out and have a bunch of sex. And that makes me sexually empowered. Now, again, it's not about whether you have a bunch of sex or, or only have sex once or you wait to, you know, it's unique for each individual, but it has to come from, in my experience, it has to come from a space of health. And that's going to look different for different people. Some people, they will have multiple partners. Some people will wait till marriage. Some people will have a one night stand. There's, it doesn't, there's not like one set way to have sex, but that's the crazy part about the, the, um, the quote unquote sex industry and porn is they promote a, a conveyor ba- belt way to have yeah. sex. And it's the most ah, prominent a, uniformity yeah. there is. Like a gen- they try to create a general metric that does not exist. Yeah, exactly. So people think they're, they're being sexually liberated. I'm like, that you're conforming. People are telling you how to have sex. They're telling you how to be. You're not even taking the time to find your own unique sexuality. You're not even taking the time to recognize that sexualized violence is not sexuality. That's not a sexual pre- preference. Being sadistic is, is not healthy. Getting off on hurting someone or getting off on being hurt is not, a, it's not self-love. So how do you, how do you help people um, that are aware of, um, you know, the exploitation, how do you help them detoxify from like psychological abuse and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, actually, so yeah, as a self-love coach. At the end of the road. That, so like, uh, sorry to kind of like cut you off. I want to kind of like further like Labyrinth and John's, uh, John's point. So let's say, for example, you're a person in the position of, I want to change this. I don't know how to change it. Mm-hmm. What, what, how, how would you, how do you go about it? Because sometimes all you know, like you said, you said before, and this is a, I want to say this is a quote that I probably remember for a lifetime when you said that the, de- the best devil, like, it's the devil you know is the devil you know, right? Essentially, if you only know one thing, that's it. So let's say, for example, you know this is not the way to live. 
that's all you know. Mm-hmm. And you're a person on the cusp of, you know, like, okay, I, I don't want this lifestyle anymore. I don't want this anymore. How do you change it? Because we can sit here all day and talk about what's wrong with it, but it's, you know, it's essentially like, you know, like an alcoholic or drug addict or anyone. It's like, they know that they most, most of the time, at least, you know, can't generalize everything. They know mm-hmm. like this is going to eventually kill me, but they don't know how to you know stop or change or whatever word you want to use. How would you change? Well, sure. Yeah. So as a self-love coach, this is actually my specialty. I, my, I work with all sorts of people, of course, but my specialty is working with covert sex trafficking survivors. So if anybody's listening and you have some questions, I have a free 30 minute consultation. Feel free to ask me anything. I'm pretty open. Um, and so that's why I speak. This, this is precisely why I do what I do so that people can become aware of this reality because not everybody knows it. So Uh, You know, when I was unconscious, it was really loving questions that brought me forward and having healthy situation. But if you don't have that around you, you're not going to see it. So this is exactly why I'm out here speaking about it so that people can become aware. So as a self-love coach, I sit down, I I see what that person's individual needs to work with. I also suggest that people do therapy because I'm not a replacement of therapist. You know, of a therapist, I do work well in tandem with therapy, you know, so, but I support each person on their individual journey and we start to work through. I start to help them through the gaslighting tactics because there's a lot of gaslighting tactics in our society and specifically for pimps. I support them gently and slowly starting to realize and starting to look at all of the the effects of this world onto their life and to slowly start to put healthy choices in place to to slowly start to receive being safe because this is a big key component. Okay. Those of us who have not known safety, we are used to, and we are conditioned to not receive safety. So that is going to be the biggest piece and the hardest part. And the biggest reason people do not leave is because they do not know what safety looks like, or they also, and, or they don't believe they're worth being safe. Because if you have a life of trauma, and you don't believe you, you're worth being safe. And that's not conscious. These things are usually not conscious. Or sometimes they are. Sometimes the self-worth is, is so low that it's, it's just verbally out there. Um, but the biggest piece is slowing the body down. So that's, you know, starting to let the body realize what safety feels like. Because for me, I'm used to, you know, as a trauma survivor, I'm used to the adrenaline. So the biggest thing that I had to do, because I've, I've been working on this for years, I didn't have anybody to show me this. So I'm, I, I had to pioneer it for myself. So it took me seven years to get past the whole, my aspect as a dom to kind of re- like really work on myself and realizing, holy crap, I hurt so many people. I didn't, I didn't, I like, what was that about? It took me seven years. It's not going to take you seven years. I just didn't have anybody to show me otherwise, because there's no one out there in the BDSM world. There's definitely no former Dom who's like, hey, there's another way, and this is X, Y, and Z. So I work with specifically who, you know, getting clear on what they were, where they were exploited in the industry, or maybe there was multiple ways they were exploited, and start to find ways to calm the system down. So if you're listening to this right now, and you are a survivor of covert sex trafficking, one of the biggest key things I could tell you is make time in your life to relax. And a lot of people think that that's some namby-pamby thing. It is not. Because when you do that, you start to healthily condition your body to receive peace, to receive relaxation. And then from there to recognize that safety is okay. Because as a survivor, now it becomes backwards for those of us who've had a lot of trauma. Safety at first can feel dangerous because when I started to like connect with healthy people, I would fight them all the time or, or my safety felt, safety felt terrifying to me because it wasn't my norm. My Isn't norm argument, was argument living hard. Is safety be subjective? Because um, so, so for example, like when we say like, for, let me say to healthy people. Mm-hmm. So when you, when you establish, you know, post, you know, the dom, you know, dominatrix world, the uh, sex industry world post, you know, even being a survivor of being trafficked, when you like what like what is a safe and healthy person something that is individual to subject and interpretation or is there Absolutely. a sort of general metric 
No, I don't think there's a general metric. I mean, I think, well, I, well, maybe, maybe on some levels, but I, I would say there is definitely what's you know, unique for each individual, but I would definitely say if some, if there's, if there's violence and sexualized violence, that's not a healthy connection. If someone is asking you to have sexual violence with them, that's not a healthy connection. I would also say if there's any self-harm going on, not a healthy connection. If you have to numb out, not, you know, like, if, and, and every human being numbs out on some level. I'm not saying you have to be this super woke, like, you know what I mean? But I'm saying if, if connecting with sexuality is predominantly disconnected. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, if it's, it's mostly disconnected. Probably the wrong thing. Yeah. What'd you say? If, if it's violent, so if like, you know, essentially like, uh, if your interpretation of insect, uh, connecting sexually, uh, sorry, literally dyslexic again so connecting with someone sexually is always interpreted by some form of violence you're probably not hanging out with the right people yeah 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 because and the thing is people who are gaslighters and uh, um they will twist that right they will use the term prude against you they'll be like oh or you know people oh you like this or you like boundaries and here's the thing with bdsm there's a hierarchy of pain i don't give a crap what anybody says that there isn't there is i've been in there for i was in there for 13 years there's a hierarchy of pain those people who who could withstand the most pain receive the most praise and attention so it's a very dangerous place also for people pleasers because there's so there's there's a, i'm being overly simplistic right now but there are two reasons people get into these worlds one trauma, but not trauma is not the only reason. The other reason is because people think that that's being sexually empowered. Okay. So mm -hmm. people will think that, you know, they'll go in there, you know, bo both of them, they're going in all thinking that, you know, you know, something's different than what's getting like, and people who go into BDSM, they think they're playing. They think they're, they're, you know, a lot of people, there are a lot of couples since 50 shades of gray who are like, Oh, you know, maybe we should do this. And I will tell you, it's act it's incredibly dangerous. There's a lot of people who are introduced to BDSM thinking that they were doing something cute or sexy with their partner. They they went in with good intentions. So not everything is like because someone went like oh, as far as when I speak about DOMs, right? There are people who are DOMs who actually really believe they're doing something good. Okay. Doing stuff again, not all the time. I mean, you know, but there are people who are in those worlds who really do believe they're doing something good. They really do. And we have a society that keeps the lie in place. And there are people who go into the BDSM world because they know they can prey on people and hide. So here's so here's the thing. If you're in a realm where people can't tell the difference between an actual predator and someone who thinks they're doing something good, it's not a realm to be in. Yeah, I think making that distinction, um, like you said before, is bringing that awareness and all that stuff. I think you, you know, providing that platform to, to educate and bring that awareness to other people that maybe are... Um, you know, to have that veil, I guess, per se, in front of their eyes um, to help, yeah. you know, pull up that, uh, that veil and show them like what the, um, what the, what the other side of that coin is, you know, and I, right. I think that's a really admirable thing to do. And, Thank you know, despite you. And all the, 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 um, you know, the backlash that you get from that, I think this is a conversation that needs to be had. Because, Thank you. you know, I, for me, at least like, this is not, a topic that I'm well versed in. And so having this type of conversation exposed me to like a different point of view. And I do think just having that, um, just, you know, like helping you provide this platform to speak out to stuff like that, I think is a really important thing. So thank you for, um, you know, for doing all that stuff, because I, like I said, I, had we not had this conversation, I would have never known about that side. Because, you know, we, before we had talked about the quote, the dark side of the industry, but you know, you had said that this is the industry, like there is no yeah. dark side to it, you know? Yeah. And so exactly. that's just another way to look at it. So, um, mm -hmm. so thank you, you know, for, for having all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of people who are going into BDSM who are like call themselves submissives because they think that that's what they are. But what happens with BDSM is BDSM takes healthy things and twists it. 
So people who sometimes call themselves submissive and, and some of those people actually aren't, they're just nurturers. And so BDSM twists it and oh, you get sucked into being submissive. And doms, I'm, I'm keeping my door open for doms. I'm, I'm ready for them to, <laughs> for them, whichever <laughs> ones want to leave, I'm here. Talk, brothers and sisters, come on. Um, because doms have, you know, the ones who actually go in there thinking they're doing something right. They have the potential to be extraordinary healers. Okay, because they, they think they're doing something well, they think they're supporting people's sexuality. But if they were to take that and transform it and like drop the BDSM, if that's what they want to do, the ones who are ready for it, they have the like all of the things that were warped in BDSM can be shifted into something healthy away from BDSM, like mm -hmm. the leadership, the, you know, ability to be conscious, you know, like just there's, there's a lot of stuff there, like the ability to um, like organized, you know, there are things, there are good qualities and things. Yeah. Something to go over in the 12 step program is taking our, um, of course I can't think of the word <laughs> to save my life, but transforming those patterns that were unhealthy and taking the healthy pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good qualities out of it and mm -hmm. actually using them. And that's an interesting, interesting standpoint because I feel as if we're going to need a part two for this. So we're right. definitely going to have you on. If you, if you allow I'm us, to, we're going to definitely wow. have a part two. This I love is talking to you guys. So anytime, you let me know. Yeah. It's been an amazing conversation. So to kind of like summarize, like, you know, more or less like kind of like the standpoint we were going to end on for today is that like the exploitation is the one form that keeps evolving. And it seems like a lot of people don't even realize they're being exploited, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And the thing to the, uh, and the thing is, like, I guess, like, all you can really do is not, you can't force, it's almost like they say you can't, what, what is the quote, the old school quote, they say you can't take a, you can't force the donkey to drink out of the river, you can just only take him to the river itself, and if they choose to or not, it's up to them. Yeah. I feel like I put too much depth into that. The quote is something far more simple, apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the same sample where it's like, you are providing so much information and so much, you know, like, insight to this world and the consequences of it. Whether or not someone takes that advice right. and actually implements it into their life is up to them. Absolutely. We hope that people do because our job here is to essentially like puzzle minds. We're just trying to just essentially get rid of some of the mysteries that are being alive. That are and life. That's like, life in general, like exposing you to different conversations, like different perspectives, just, you know, stuff that maybe you're wondering about, maybe you don't even wonder about, but just having these conversations, I think these are important, like I said before. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that we were able to, to book you because yeah. I, I feel like I've learned a lot just from, from just from talking to you, you know? Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. We will definitely have a part two, Chris, somebody here. Like this has been oh, amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Like, is there anything that you want to plug as well too? So people can kind of like, you know, go and you know get more informed on all these things yeah that can maybe sure. like look at you for for help or, or anything yeah. just in general yeah absolutely so i just came out with my book it's called from the mud the alchemy of self-love poetry and it's on amazon and um if you go to my website openheartsunite.org you'll see you know lots of information i'm also on instagram you'll see you'll see all the links on my website i'm doing a self-love poetry workshop called turning poetry turning trauma into poetry that's coming out March 27th. All the information is there. And if you are someone who is a covert sex trafficking survivor, or if you know someone who was, and you, you want to share this information with them, reach out to me on openheartsunite.org and set up a free 30 minute um, consultation. I'm here to answer your questions. I'm here to you know, be here for you. So you're not alone. Cool. Yeah, we'll put all those links in the in the bio for anyone that needs to uh, to reach out to you or just wants to check out your work. Um, like I said, yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, we'll hopefully, have a, a part two soon. You know, and would love to the making. Um, if you like this podcast, smash that like button, that follow button, whatever you need to do to, to help support us. Um, follow us on our social media platforms: Puzzle Minds Podcast on Instagram and Twitter is Puzzle Minds Pod. Uh, last but not least, thank you at Official Block of the Week for the weekly cover arts, um, episode cover arts. Uh, other than that, everyone stay puzzled. Peace.